Church family, uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 in our study, as you guys well know, we are back at it. Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 through 6. This will be our fourth week in these six verses. People are asking, are we going to speed up? I think we're going pretty quick as it is right now. No, there will be times, there will be ebb and flow of, of our pace. But my intentions are to be in this book when Jesus Christ returns. So we'll be here as long as it takes. Or as short as it takes, we'll see. Romans chapter 1, I'll open up with verse 1. If you'll read on the screens or out of the New King James Version Bible, you pick it up in verse 2. Romans chapter 1, I begin verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declares to be the Son of God, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated, church. Well, Charles Spurgeon gave a tremendous quote, and I want to read it to you. It's deep. It's old English, but it is textbook Charles Spurgeon and truth. Spurgeon said, his divine plan is independent of time. Do not dream, Christian, that the ages have changed so that in this day God cannot be or do his uh, mighty works. Beloved, if you can conceive of an age that is worse than another, I think we would all say our time is the worst, that's how it feels, so much the more is it a fit platform for a heavenly energy. The more difficult, the more room for omnipotence to show himself. There is elbow room for the great God when there is some great thing in the way, some great difficulty that he may overturn, says Spurgeon. Well, the great difficulty regarding the soul of man was man having his sin removed from him. That every single one of us in the hearing of this message today, we can all agree, even the atheist right now can agree, that there is some psyche, there's some, there's some torment regarding what is right and wrong. Believer or unbeliever alike, there is a dilemma that plagues the human heart that in us there is this Shame from what we've done wrong. And we try to hide that. We try to manipulate that. We try to drink that burden away. Or we try to somehow seek enough pleasure to mask it. But it remains nonetheless. And the book of Romans is this book of the Bible that ought to be read by everybody all the time. The Christian, listen, is admonished to know this book constantly. We should, whatever we're embarked upon in our normal Christian development, we should always be dabbling in the book of Romans. And if you're not a Christian today, I want to lay this out to you. I, I put this challenge before you. Don't be afraid. If you're not a Christian, what do you, you don't have to be afraid, right? You don't believe in God. So, so take up this challenge. Read the book of Romans. So I don't believe in God then read the book of Romans. And I believe that if you read the book of Romans as a full-blown, highly developed atheist, you may come to faith in God. And I'll tell you the reason why. You open the book of Romans and you're going to find out that the God that you think doesn't exist is the God that's speaking to you about sin and about heaven and about hell and about redemption and about damnation and about eternity. And he'll be the God that will say to you, I came because I love you. I'm God. I died on the cross. I rose again from the dead. And the book of Romans tells you that you cannot hide behind any moral performance. You cannot hide behind any self a grandizement program or some 12 steps to making yourself better, it strips all of it away until you're standing there looking at the cross of Christ and the God of salvation. The book of Romans is so powerful and God calls you to be his child. He looks to you to be one of his. And though for many of us, we are already followers of Christ, it's my prayer that you know him today even more and for the non-believer to come to know 
that he is the God of all salvation. Church, we looked at last time being called. The number one fact that we saw in verse one was God has called you and I to be a new man. Paul made that announcement three ways that you and I as believers have been brought under a greater authority. We saw that. We saw secondly that it's with a greater commissioning that God not only saves you to come under this, listen, the, the authority of Jesus Christ where he is our master and we are his slave, but with that comes a great commissioning, that there's a great joy that's found out that you and I as slaves to Jesus, we replicate that news. We tell other people about it. We tell them when we uh, invite them. We've got a, a tremendous relationship to share. And then we also saw in that first point that being separate under the gospel of God, that we have come for a greater purpose, a greater purpose God has engineered for us. In our previous study, our last time together, church, we saw in point number two that we've got a new voice, that God has given us a new voice as a believer. Look at verse two. It says that which he has promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He's talking about the word of salvation, the gospel of grace, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And that truth means, friends and family, that we as Christians do not go around telling people what we think and what we feel. We are to go about with our new voice telling people what we, listen, three things, what we experience, and that is we know what we believe. Say amen to that. As believers, we know what it is that we believe as Christians. It's not what we feel, it's what God has announced. And we saw that he gave that to us by speaking previously, beforehand, says the Bible, that God gave a promise of how he would reach us. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10 is a verse we looked at, and the Bible tells us there that it is God, the God of the Bible, and I love this. That it's he declaring the end from the beginning. Just right there ought to cause you to sit up. That the God of the Bible says, I'm going to tell you the end at the beginning. I like that stuff. For those of us who are impatient, that's really good news. (laughs) Right? We sign up. Hey, God, this is great. How does it end? I told you guys before, when I got saved, the first book in the Bible I read when I got saved was, I figured out, I know they told me to read John's gospel, but I figured, I don't know, I'm going to go to the end of the book because I'm impatient. And I read the book of Revelation. It's the first book I read. And it's awesome because if you don't know what to expect, it's fantastic because the book just screams at you, the awesomeness of God. But God says, I know the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying or promising, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And it's awesome to realize that the pleasure of God is the salvation of your soul. That delights God's heart. And we saw that you and I speak what we know. Secondly, we know this, is the fact that we speak what we hear. When you and I open up the word of God, the word of God speaks to us. He says that he spoke to us by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Right there, that verse announces to all of us that God's word, the Bible, actually challenges you to attack it. You think about that. I was just recently uh, reading where Voltaire, the great thinker, mocked and ridiculed the concept and the idea of God. And he was the great know-it-all of his day and age. And Voltaire, he said, uh, soon, within a lifetime, the belief in God will be extinct. And it's interesting because within a lifetime, the Bible rolled off the first Gutenberg press and that opening door allowed the Bible to be known and read even to this moment right now. I love that. Voltaire, the great thinker, was wrong. God was right. God is always right. And then we saw last time, and this is where we ended, by the way, is that you and I have a new voice because we speak what we've learned. And it's all about verse 3 concerning His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible announces to us that God has given us his son. That God in the Bible has spoken that he has a son. That his son, listen, his son would become, as we'll see in a moment, 
veiled in human flesh, that his son would be deposited into this world for the entire and absolute act of the redemption of mankind. And I don't know why we resist that as humans. Why do we kick against that? No matter who you might be, is it not true that until you come to know Jesus, death is the great worrisome plague of your life? Let's be honest. We've got to be honest. What is the great danger and the great plague of the human soul? It is death. I'll submit to you this morning that everything that drives man and whatever he does is for this purpose. My life's going to come to an end. Remember way back, I don't know, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, the bumper stickers, they were so ridiculous. They were so humanistic. He who dies with the most toys, look out for number all this stuff. I see there's about seven of us here from the 70s. That's probably good news. It was all about self. Grab all the gusto you can. It's, it's look out for number one. I've got to get all the toys so that by the time I die, I win. What a dumb thing that is. No, listen. The fear of death has plagued men from the beginning. And people want to find fault with Jesus Christ, the believe in God in the Bible, and yet it answers the greatest plague of the human heart, that Christ came to save sinners, and therein is the problem, isn't it? The grave has no power over the person who has come to find life in Jesus Christ, but to do that, we must recognize that we are sinners and he's Savior. And that's the big stumbling block, isn't it? It really is. And so, church, we pick it up as we look at this, that you and I, in our next argument, is found in verse 4. He says there, and declare to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So the third point is this, you and I are called to a new power. And I want you to uh, take advantage of of your note-taking, and the margins of your Bible write this. We're talking about a power that is of God. Oh, please, I don't know how to put this across. I'm, I'm at a great disadvantage because of my, my inability to communicate to you this truth. That in human effort, we try to muster the power to do it. Everything about us is that you must roll up your sleeves and get it done. And I understand that. Look, if you're building a bridge, I get it. If you're going to launch a rocket to Mars, then roll your sleeves up and go for it. It makes sense in every aspect of life, but when it comes to you and I experiencing what God has planned for you and I regarding eternity, we need a new power because you and I don't have it. We don't have that kind of power. And when we talk about this power, where does it lie? Where is the strength of the believer? Where's the strength in the Christian life? Here it comes, the strength of the Christian life is in the message that God has sent us, that God has given us. It's the message. It's absolutely awesome. It's the message. You see, don't you mean it's the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, of course I believe it's the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit communicates to us salvation and life and meaning by the message. The Holy Spirit uses the message. And look at this, what he does. He declares to us, the Holy Spirit does, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The word declared here is a a great word. It it, it means uh, to mark off. It means to set a boundary. The word means a predetermined or premeditated appointment to announce something. So church family, listen up. It's God's will regarding you knowing his power that you understand the message. And what does the Christian message say? The Christian message announces that God with a premeditated determination has declared Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. It speaks from eternity that God knew, that God existed, that God engineered, that the plan of God, this whole thing, man, I don't don't mean to be light about this and I don't want to make it sound funny, but you and I are here right now living out this moment in time and yet God is not surprised by anything that happens today. He's anticipated it. He knew your life before you got out of bed this morning that you would make it here by whatever means you did. If you came by airplane, car, or scooter, God knew it. 
and he's anticipated it. The premeditated mindset of God was, I'm here to reach you this morning in this church at this moment or through this broadcast that it's the will of God. And this is not an accident. Can I say it this way? It's all rigged. <laughs> it's all set up. It's rigged. What do you mean it's rigged? You think your friends bribed you in coming here? They, did you think they told you, hey, let's go to the restaurant tomorrow morning after church. That probably won't be open. And, uh, and, uh, and if it is, you'll have to eat through your mask. And, and so we'll, and you know what? We'll, we'll go. Hey, and you said, yeah, I want a free meal, so I'll go. No, listen, you thought you were manipulating the moment? You thought your friends were manipulating the moment? Not at all. Listen, God knew. He knew. He knew all along. He knew, listen, he knew about last night that whatever went on last night caused you to say, I think I'm going to church tomorrow. <laughs> he knew that. The whole year, the whole month, the whole moment, God knew that. He declared, and this is the message, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he did this with power. Our message is that Jesus Christ has come, and it's even, listen, it's even more powerful than that, because when we define it, church, are you listening? When we define it, it is the fact that Jesus Christ came as God incarnate. When you want to know what God looks like and sounds like and what God speaks, God took upon himself skin. And that manifestation is the Son of God, Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity. I'm going to give you a string of verses. Are you ready? Yes. Oh my goodness, that was pathetic. <laughs> let's, let's, we'll edit it so you for radio, so you guys will sound amazing. Okay, so three, two, one. Are you guys ready for this? Yes! I bet you are. John chapter one, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the Bible tells us there is the logos of God, none other than Jesus Christ. Listen, Luke one, verse 30. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Notice, bring forth a son, premeditated, and shall call his name Jesus. The angel is telling Mary what you're going to name this boy. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest. Look, listen, listen uh, you may be led by your mom. And she may have pictures of you all over, your, all over her house, but you are not the son of the highest. That applies to one, my friend. That is an attribute of God's son and no other. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Jesus was a direct genealogical line of David, according to the bloodstream which qualifies him to be the Messiah of Israel, by the way. Verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the son of God, eternal, premeditated, Christ come. That's the God we worship. That's the one we know. Oh, and this is my favorite. In my notes, I have a holy huddle for sure. See, what does that mean? Because when I read you this verse, I can see in my mind... A huddle from heaven with angels, huddled about. Mary's about ready to give birth. It's just about the moment of Christmas to be brought into the world. Mary's in labor. The baby is coming. And in 1 Timothy 3.16, the Bible tells us without question or without debate, without argument, without doubt, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. Watch this. He was seen by angels. See the word seen? It means that the angels watched him be born. They get... Now, I mean this with all due respect. Mary, probably giving birth as a Hebrew woman would have, you know, they squatted in those days. They didn't lay down. She squatted down to give birth to baby Jesus and the angels gathered about in the invisible realm and it says here that he was seen by angels. The word means that angels had big eyes and a big mouth, wide-eyed and open mouth, gawk. The word means to gawk. The angels who quite possibly have never seen Jesus before because the Bible says when angels 
appear before God in heaven, what does it say? Isaiah tells us they veil their body with one set of their wings. With the other set of the wings, they fly in his presence. They have three sets of wings. And with the third set of wings, they cover their face in his presence. Is it possible that when God was becoming incarnate into this world, the birthing of Jesus Christ, that the angels showed up at the birth moment to see for the first time the one that created them coming as a human? The Bible says that he made him a little lower than the angels. You and I have been created a little lower than the angels. And Jesus came into our estate to die for us. I don't mean to bash angels, but angels cannot be redeemed. They're unredeemable. Jesus came as a man, as a human, and died on the cross for the sins of humanity to redeem us. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed on throughout the world and taken, that is back, taken back to heaven in glory. In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be at all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a mighty or a multitude of a heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is who was born in Bethlehem. This is the Son of God. This is not some, this is not some manifestation of an order of enlightened ones, and you too can become God. No. This is the one and only. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that he was found, being found in appearance as a man. I love that statement. You want to know why? Because you and I, when we're born, we're born naturally in the appearance of a man. Mankind. The appearance of mankind. Any of you are, you know, don't be offended by that. It says man. Okay. Get over it. It's mankind. Mankind. Like humankind. So you and I had no choice. When we were born into this world, we were brought into this world as humankind because that's what we are. For God to become humankind. Amen. Oh, that's something different. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God. Oh. Declared to be the Son of God with power. I'm going to give you... a Quite a few more verses, but then we'll be on with this. See, Jack, I don't know if I believe all this. Well, let's look at the science. The Old Testament prophets promised, proclaimed. In Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you or glorified you. That's what the Old Testament said. Well, isn't it interesting that the New Testament apostles recorded the following? In Hebrews 1, verse 5, they understood Psalm 2, verse 7 to say in Hebrews 1, 5, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. See the uniqueness of Christ? And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. That's taken right out of the Old Testament, friends. And the New Testament apostles acknowledge that. Again, the Old Testament prophets proclaimed in Psalm 97, verse 7, let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. I love that. Can you imagine all the gods who are made out of images? They're made out of stones and wood. And the Bible says, you better bow your knee. Well, you can't bow the knee of an idol. Oh, yeah, you can. You have to break them. That's how an idol bows. You break their knee. And the Bible says, worship him. But listen, the Bible tells us that the New Testament authors looked at Hebrews 1, verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. This is Jesus. The Old Testament prophets proclaimed in, in uh, excuse me, Psalm 45, verse 6, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Look at Hebrews 1.8. 
But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Do you see that? Listen, the science is this. The Old Testament said that this is the Son of God. And the New New Testament says that's exactly right. That's exactly what happened. Now, that only leaves you open for your opinion. Don't you love this? I know. now, Now, look, maybe I've been overwhelmed by this and maybe I've duped myself if I am duped let me alone (laughs) leave me be but when the Bible says thousands of years ago this is who the Messiah the Son of God is and then 2,000 years ago come the Apostles and they say oh my goodness those thousands and thousands of year old prophecies that we read about also like you guys would in the 21st century We were eyewitnesses to the fulfillment of those promises. That doesn't, listen, that doesn't make it an issue of faith so much for me as it is looking at the facts and acquiescing to them, embracing them. Well, you Christians, man, you know, you, well, what about us? Listen, we've been persuaded. We've been convinced Because I believe it is absolutely proof positive that you can argue the existence of God. When God says this 3,000 years ago, and then it happens, and it's eyewitness recorded, that leaves you with your own opinion. Or it leaves you bowing the knee to the great fact that God has come to us and has spoken to us. What a beautiful joy that is, and what a great fact it is. There's a new power, and that power, listen is powered by the source. Look at verse four. According to the spirit of holiness. This is amazing. This is the Holy Spirit. As believers, you and I have a new power. And that new power is by the Holy Spirit. And notice that he's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness. Simply a reference to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if you care, I'd like you to write this down. The The source of our power, the power source is in fact the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, as we're speaking of Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a person. I think the Holy Spirit is the least understood person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate. You know, he's the one. He's the one that's responsible for the church the last 2,000 years. It's his job to get you and I to heaven. Did you know that? Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose again from the dead, Jesus went back to heaven. For the last 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit's been here. Making and building his church, his bride. But you and I are not to do this work on our own church. The source, mark it down, please. It's the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. You know this well. Jesus said, you shall receive, what's the word? power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Wow. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost or the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit's power. For those of us that are in this room today and we think that we are the least usable by God, that he would never use us, we're thinking he's going to use somebody else. God is speaking to you about his power right now this morning. I mean it. I'm not just saying this because I'm supposed to say this. You might be here today saying, man, you know what, Pastor Jack, you know, my friends witness, my friends lead people to Christ, my friends feed the homeless, my friends... Listen, my dear friend, you want to see the power of God and you want to know the source of the power? Say, Holy Spirit, use me. Holy Spirit, use me. You know what? That prayer never gets old. I'm telling you right now. uh, I'll tell you guys. I don't know if I'll tell second service or third service, but I'll tell you. (laughs) So I think it was, I think it was Saturday, Saturday mid-morning, something like that. Lisa and I were standing in downtown Boston, the Boston Commons, the beautiful park, the great green area that has been preserved for centuries. And I I told Lisa, I said, right here, George Whitfield stood right here. And he preached to 30,000 people, Ben Franklin said, right here. No microphone. Miraculous. Boom. 
It's said that Sam Adams at Boston Commons accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Ben Franklin said when Whitfield was preaching, it's as though the whole nation was turning religious. When Whitfield was preaching and thousands of people were coming to Christ and, man, I stood there on Saturday and I said, Lord, if I'm wrong, forgive me, but you gotta, you gotta hear this. But if you want to do something in the last few moments of world history at this time, I'm, I'm willing with all my inabilities and inadequacies, I'm willing to be used like Whitfield was used right here. Use me, use me, Lord, back home. Use me, and, and you just ask. You know what? My life has been blessed so much, and I gotta tell you, here's the reason why I ask. When you ask, listen, when you ask, you're in need. When you're in need, you ask. Look, when you're in need, you walk around like this. Do you not? When you're in need, and God sees me as a beggar. God, if you don't, God, if you don't, God, if you don't, if you don't show up, if you don't bless, if you don't lead, if you don't guide, I'm in trouble. Are you hearing me? How about now we as a church body, in fact, just first service alone, you ask God that and second and third service will say, why doesn't that happen in second and third service like it does at first? You ask and let God use you with the source of his power. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that liberty is, listen, from all that you are and all that hinders, God says, I can use you. So I'm scared, but use me, God. I'm weak, but use me, God. Listen, there's not an excuse you can offer up where God would say, hey, I can use that. He loves that. Salvation is the source. Salvation, its source is the Holy Spirit. Power is the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is done by the Holy Spirit according to the spirit of holiness. We could go on all day. The keeping, listen, I love this. The keeping power of God is the Holy Spirit. How many of you are Christians this morning? Raise your hands. Did you know that God is in contract with himself? That the Holy Spirit is under orders to keep every true child of God in this room in route to heaven? Jude chapter 1 verse 24, Jude 1 24 says, Now to him who is able, hallelujah, I'm not... Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, power, both now and forever. Amen. God does that. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to do that in your life. Oh, I love that. His power. The third thing under this is the fact that in verse 4 teaches us that we're powered by the purpose that God has given us a purpose. And here it is, look at this. Verse four announces that it's by the resurrection from the dead. <laughs> I don't know how far we'll go after this portion of this verse because this is awesome. The greatest, as I mentioned earlier, single most powerful reality is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. You say, oh man, I heard that a thousand times. Listen, you may have heard it a thousand times, but the closer you get to death, the more sweet it becomes. Say, but Jack, I believe the Bible, but you're sure talking about a lot of power there. Well, where's that power today? I understand the question. Dark clouds all around the world seem to be gathering over the faithful. The world is seemingly becoming more and more hostile towards the Christian and towards the Bible and church and faith, right? We get that, we see that. You can look back and say, oh my goodness, it looks like it's all over. It looks like the hour is upon us, that the, the church has come to its end. There's no hope. But that's why I read you that quote from Spurgeon at the beginning. In the darkest hour when things seem to be impossible, I love how Spurgeon put it, that 
There's elbow room for the omnipotent to do his work when things seem the darkest. We all agree things seem dark and our back is up against the wall. Pastors are being arrested. Churches are being marginalized. The churches that are closed have played right into the hand of the government. And then the government is hunting down churches that are open. Ladies and gentlemen, church family know this, that behind the scenes is a spiritual battle. And the gates of hell will not, cannot, will never prevail against the work of God. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. And ultimately, if we are marched off to the stake to be burned, as many of the Puritans were, Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead, and our hope and assurance is resurrection from the dead. Amen. Jesus Christ came back. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter spoke up and said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs from which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the, what? Determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It's all rigged. <laughs> Jesus was to die on a certain day in Jerusalem for the sins of the world. But that doesn't excuse man from his decision. You have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Hello? Because it was not possible that he should be held by it, that is by death. For David says concerning him, and he quotes, he goes on to quote Psalm 16, verse 8. Peter quotes Psalm 16, verse 8. But I love this. The very thing that causes you today to be ultimately gripped with concern, Jesus broke by being resurrected from the dead. Yes. Acts 13, verse 32. 13.32 says, and we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers that God fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, resurrected Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. God says, listen, when Christ rose again from the dead, um, how do I put this? When Jesus rose from the dead, remember, he was the man, Jesus, being resurrected from the dead. Listen, did he not die? Yes. What part of him died? The human part of him died, right? His body died. But on the third day rose again from the dead. He's our prototype. He is our forerunner to guarantee us who believe in him that we too will rise from the dead. That is speaking of the body. Your body laid in the ground will not stay in the ground. That's good news. Let me tell you. In Romans 1.16, this is why Romans 1.16 is so prevalent everywhere. And it's more and more prevalent. And I love it. You see it on posters and stickers and articles. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What does that mean? I am not ashamed of the good news, the glad tidings that encompasses why Christ came. That he came and he paved the way for me to go to heaven. He died for my sins and rose again from the grave. And that he has absolutely busted hell and death. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to the salvation or for salvation for everyone who believes. Number four in our study today, number four, is found in verses five through six, and we're called to a new work. I like this. It's a new work of grace, church. Look at verse five. Through him we have received grace and apostleship. You say, Jack, come on, man, that's written to Paul. What about me? No, 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 this is you. You see the word we? It's the third word over. That's us. Through him we. Paul could have said, 
Through him, all of us apostles. Through him, all of us who people will paint in oil paintings and talk about in the future. Nope. We. All who trust Christ. Watch this. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship. This speaks about divine enablement. The word receive here means, watch, through him we have gathered, collected, picked up, we've taken hold of, we have obtained. How do we obtain something? Through him. You pick it up, you get it, you grab it. The Bible says this is ours, possible, now. So you've, you've gathered this to yourself. You choose this. God offers it, you pick it up. And you grab it. Grace. The word grace, charis, is divine act. God's divine act of favor. So what is it that you're picking up? You're picking up God's divine acts of favor. His appointed kindness towards you. His specific blessing upon your life. The grace of God. This is, listen, this is divine enablement. Meaning this. That everything that God lays out before you. You, though you don't pay for it, you don't provide, you don't, you don't empower it, it's there, but because you've created the image of God, God is giving you the free moral agency of choice, you've got to grab it and pick it up. See, Jack, in any of that, do I get the credit? Zero. Kind of like this. It's kind of like the man who thinks he doesn't need God because he's got $100 million in the bank. And he's young, so he feels good. Okay, he looks at himself in the mirror and he says, wow, look how good I look. I've got $100 million in the bank. I can do anything I want. I'm going to have lunch tomorrow in Paris and I'll have dinner in Rome. And you know what I'm talking about? No, of course not. You do not know this. I don't know this and you don't know this. But I'm making this up right now. So just go along. Try to convince that man that he needs God. It's not going to happen. Try to convince him he has need of something. He doesn't have need of anything. And he knows it. The enablement is that guy thinks his good looks got him somewhere and that his brain power got him that money and that that money is going to keep him safe. And he thinks he doesn't have a reason to believe in God when in reality, God gave him everything he has. <laughs> He walks around, don't I look good? Well, what are you going to do when you look ugly? (laughs) Aren't I rich? What are you going to do when you find out that your $100 million cannot save you from your cancer? What are you going to do? All of a sudden, you realize, wait a minute. By the way, you know this, right? The Bible says a haughty, a proud look and a haughty spirit God hates. Why? Because it's to walk around with your chest sticking out thinking that you did it. You did nothing. You did nothing. And God loves you so much that you know what? You might be walking along and feeling all so good and you feel a little pain. (laughs) Or somebody sues you. Did you see in the news this week? Bill and Melinda Gates are divorcing. And uh, who's going to get these many billions and who's going to get these many billions and they're going to divide it down the middle? Oh, poor things. Little does Bill Gates know that everything that he has has been given to him by the God he doesn't believe in or the God that he doesn't even care to bow the knee to. It's remarkable. It's a work of grace, people, in our lives. What a tremendous statement that is. Through him we have received, gifted, gifts, God gives the gift of salvation. He extends it. And if you say, well, I believe it, that's a gift. (laughs) Your faith is a gift. God's grace is a gift. We take credit for nothing. We cannot. We're called to be a humble people, a thankful people, because we've received the gifts of God in life, all the good things, and certainly, of course, the gift of God's grace. And he says here, apostleship, which is a fun word. It means to be sent away. It means that God, listen, 
you know, as I said, we're in that, we were on our uh, God in American Heritage Tour, and uh, look, uh, New England's beautiful. Amen. It's very beautiful. It's very meaningful. Spectacular. Uh, but after about, a, after about eight hours of rain, I couldn't wait to get home. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get home. But as I think about that, God sends his people to places that in cultures and, and, and worlds that maybe we wouldn't go to. I mean, you look at the New England winter and there's just no way. But people, listen, God sent his people there. We, all, we learned all about the pilgrims and we went to Plymouth and we read the documents and the, we heard the statements from centuries ago. And they had to do it. You know, it was burning in them. Nobody, nobody says, hey, excuse me, you want to sign up? It's going to be incredible. We're going to get shot at by Indians. My, half of us are going to die. And it's going to be really rough for like 10 years. But you know what? We'll be able to believe and preach and read our Bibles without the king's interruption of that in our lives. We'll have religious freedoms. You, you want to go? And people left their comfortable church. And they got on a 106 foot long ship, which in the ocean looks like a toothpick at best. And they came here for their freedoms. Because God was doing a work of grace. He received, they received his call of salvation. And you know what? God sent them away. Apostleship. He said, well, that's good for them. Yeah. Well, the word is to all of us. God, God wants to send you away. He said, Pastor, is that, is that a message from the Lord to me to move out of California? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But if you're a believer, I know this, he's going to send you away if it's down the street or to the ends of the earth as, as listen, as one who is an apostleship, one who's moving and going and taking this message, it's a work of grace. Amen. It's exciting. Also this, it's a work of life. Verse 5 teaches us, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. See, that's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. It's a difficult verse to interpret and to study. For obedience to the faith. Simply this, you and I have been persuaded that what God has put in our lives is worth telling other people. What he's done in us is worthy of you and I telling all the nations. You, you probably already figured out what that word is. You've heard it before already. That word ethnos, ethnicities, the human race. Our witness is the point here. And it's our, listen, our faith is to be our response to what God has done in our lives. In 2 Corinthians, listen, we're almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, but we have this treasure. I love this. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? Yeah, Jesus, the gospel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the earthen vessel? My body, your body. You want to know how good God is? You take a pot. You know the little, you know the little pot your kid makes at school? Comes, they mold it in class and they put the little heart on it and the handle thing. Or maybe it's even the ashtray, right? When in doubt, make, it, make an ashtray out of it. <laughs> that same, <laughs> that same ashtray is made out of the same elements you are. Your kid shapes the ashtray or the cup, and God has shaped you. The same elements are within us. It's how you're shaped. And all along your life's experience, life has sought, this fallen world has sought, Satan has sought to shape you and mold you into its image. All the while, God has sought to reach you with his gospel to mold you into his image. And the world has done this to you, and God has been quietly, softly waiting and reaching out to you. And it comes down to understanding what kind of life do you want to live? You want to be alive unto God and see what he's going to do with your life and let him take control, or you just want to sit there on the mantle 
or on the table like an ashtray. <laughs> the same elements. Some people, of course, are not ashtrays. But their life is about as exciting as one because they choose not to follow God. And God says, I want to give you life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, church, a few more verses, we're done here. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 says, listen to this. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. As believers, God goes like this. Oh, every time they, listen, can you imagine? Can you imagine? What if God says, Gabriel, Michael, shh, guys, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, guys, you seraphim and cherubim, turn it down for a moment. Listen, 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 listen to them. They're singing down there at first service. Listen to them. They're praising me. Listen. Oh, it's a room of life. It's an aroma of life. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. Listen to this. And among those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma of death leading to death. And to the other aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Paul is saying, we're just here to preach the gospel. We love him and we're going to live our lives for him. None of us are strong enough. Who's sufficient for this? We're called to be operating in this world to share with every man, woman, boy, and girl the love of God, the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Who is sufficient? This should be the business of angels. Who are we mere humans to say this? That you can have your sins forgiven. Who are we to say that? That Christ rose again from the dead. Who are we? He didn't send angels. He sends us. Because another man, another woman, another boy or another girl can understand if God can forgive them, he can forgive me. It doesn't matter if an angel tells us our sins can be forgiven. What does an angel know about us? What can an angel experience? The world, an unbelieving world, they smell you and you stink. You are a wretched stench of death unto death. One another, we smell as an aroma. And here's where we end. Verse 6, it's a new work of confidence. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. We're called by Jesus. So you say, what does this mean to me? Where do you land this thought? Right here. To the person who today is a believer hearing this message, they're going, yes. You get that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, God. Mm. Praise the Lord. Then there's the person that is saying, I've never heard this before. And I think I need to do something about this. What do I need to do about this? You need to choose for yourself. You need to decide if you're among those who Christ has called. Do you want him? Now, listen carefully. Do you want him because you don't want to go to hell? Well, I get that. I mean, initially, that makes sense. Sure. That's maybe where you begin. I don't want to go there. Okay, the next thought has to be this. Do you understand that that's where you're going automatically without him? Say, man, that's kind of rude. First service, right? No, it's exactly the loving thing to say. It's the loving thing to say. Because, listen, that immediately transcends, it goes beyond the heaven or hell issue, and it says this, I need him. It's not that I want to pick, I want to pick this, I want to pick that. Wait a minute, when you hear this, it's forget about what I pick. I need him, I need him desperately. So what is it that you need about him? That he saves me, that he'll forgive me, that he'll wash me clean, he'll give me new life. Yes. 
And this will be your confidence. Friends, this will be the confidence of yours for the rest of your life. It's not what you, it's not what you've, you do for God. It's not that deception where you look at all the good things I've done and sh- surely God has taken a notice of all the benevolent things I've done. That is so repulsive to the Christian. It's disgusting because you know what? Every good thing that we've done, we're not even sure if it was a good thing because the good stuff we did, it could have probably been tainted by a bad, a bad motive. Are you with me? How many good things we do? I'm going to do that thing. And we do it, and we're not sure if we did it for the right motive. Now watch. Some people say, well, that's why I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> no, you can't do that. We cannot know our hearts. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked. Listen, you love God. You do what he says because, listen, he loves you and he saved you. And so you obey him because there's life in that. And listen, you give him your motive constantly. Here's the fun thing. Even if we did things with the wrong motive, when we say, Lord, forgive me if I did it with the wrong motive, you be glorified in it, and you get up and live. If that happens in this first service, the world will be transformed. Many of you live in different towns or cities. You can go back to your locations and transform your community by getting involved. Because listen, because Christ has saved you, you're going to be salt and light. I leave you with this. You are called of Jesus Christ to know his will for your life. He wants you to know it. You are called of Jesus Christ to know his purpose for your life. He wants you to discover that. You're called of Jesus Christ to know his joy for your life. He's got it waiting for you. You're called of Jesus Christ to know his desire for your life. It's better than any desire you have for your life. You're called of Jesus Christ to know his Eternity, his eternity. In the end, church, we're going to stand before him. And the Bible tells us that our lives will be reviewed. And the scripture says that as he responds in our lives by acknowledging what we've done in this, in this world now, it says that he's going to give us crowns. I don't like that, but I'm, it sounds funny but it's okay, listen, crowns, Jesus, you're going to give me a crown? Yes, for every good thing you've done to my glory. Okay, it's kind of weird. I don't want to wear a crown. Watch, why? What do you want to do with it? I want to throw it back at you. I want to give it back to you. Oh, Jack, let me finish the verse. (laughs) You'll be rewarded with a crown of righteousness, which on the day we will turn it around and cast it back at him to give him all the glory. Father, we praise you. We love you, God. We thank you that any man or woman, boy and girl, right here, right now, would say yes to Jesus. Yes, Lord, come into my life. Yes, Lord, save me from my sins. Yes, Lord, thank you that you have called me, God, as my heart is awakened and stirred to put my faith in you. Oh, God, transform my life. Maybe you're here right now as we continue to pray and you're saying, I want to know this. I, if this is true, I want this life. Oh, it is true, friend. But you've got to open the door. You've got to open the door. Are you expecting hope to arrive? Are you expecting life to arrive? How about forgiveness? Purpose? Are you expecting that to arrive? Listen, when you're expecting something to arrive, you know how your, your app tells you that your package is a mile away? You get, don't you, don't you, oh, oh here it comes. And you, you see the truck pull up, don't you? And that guy runs to your front door. If it's something that you really want, don't you open the door? You do that every day, don't you? But have you ever done it? When Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open up. And let me in. I will come into that person and become one with them. Sup, eat, become one. Fellowship, share life. Whoever you may be right here, right now, you say yes to Jesus. 
that's you today, dear friends. I'm not going to have you come forward at this moment. The hour is late, but I will ask you this. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you're saying yes to this offer. I would love for you to go back to the prayer room after the service and get a Bible and be welcome to the family of God. But the greatest thing now is the decision that you make. Father, I pray for those who have raised their hands. Lord, you've done a work in their hearts. God, we pray that you continue to stir them up and cause them, Lord, as your spirit prompts them and speaks ever so gently but persistently. Father, as they leave this building today, may your overwhelming presence do to them what you've done to all of us. You'll never leave them or forsake them. Transform them by the power of your word. And above all things, we thank you, Lord, for giving us your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.